If you um, have uh, one of the skinnies that we handed to you when you walked in the door, um, maybe you'll notice that under the sermon section that it actually says, I think, um, 2 Timothy being the text for this morning. Um, but uh, we, I felt like the Lord called an audible sometime yesterday morning, and we uh, changed over. And so we're going to look at um, we're going to look at this passage that Danielle read for us here in Luke, the seventh chapter. And then next week we're going to hit um, 2 Timothy. So we'll actually be doing uh, two weeks on this subject matter. And for those of you that are visiting, or those of you that may maybe have been out for the last couple of weeks, um, let me just try to introduce the sermon series and the subject matter. Um, But by telling you, I'll I'll tell you this story. I'll illustrate it like this. Um, Several years ago, I think it's probably been four or five years ago, um, in our house, uh, Luann and I experienced a uh, a gnat infestation, right? So we're um, normally, I I would think, pretty clean folks and uh, don't have many critters or or bugs. But all of a sudden, uh, we had these gnats. And so um, we're talking about like gnats on plague proportions is what we're talking about here, you know? It's not just, oh, here's a few gnats, but they're like gnats everywhere. And so we bought some spray. We're spraying spray. I get on Google, right? And I Google how to get rid of, you know, stupid gnats. And um, they tell you how to build like a gnat trap, which you take a jar and you put some vinegar in it. And then you create this funnel where the gnats can fly in. And so I've got like them sitting out all over the home, but still to no avail. Gnats on top of gnats on top of gnats. Um, We repented and still had gnats, and so we tried, you know, everything we knew to do to get rid of the gnats, and then one day Luann comes to me, and she says, Andy, I've noticed that it seems as if the gnats are coming from my son, Grayson, who was seven or eight at the time. They seem like they're coming from Grayson's room, and I'm like, well, I thought they were in the kitchen. She goes, no, I don't think so, and so we begin to, you know, well, let's look, and so we go in, and sure enough, Grayson has, uh, the vast majority of the gnats are in his room. We begin looking around, and there is, in Grayson's room, Grayson had a trash can. It was actually a Wally, Wally, right? Remember that guy? It was a Wally trash can, and uh, Wally was uh, full of, or had actually two banana peels and an apple core, which was what was in Wally, and we'd forgotten about Wally, and so on the Fridays when we'd collect the trash, we'd skipped over that for evidently some weeks, and that was the actual culprit, the cause of the gnats. And so what we did was we threw uh, Wally away, right? Not just getting rid of the trash. We got rid of the trash can and all just to ensure that we could get rid of that. In a few days, the gnats flew and they were gone. And so I say that to illustrate in a way where we've been, that this is what we're talking about in the sermon series is oftentimes you and I, we, we experience negative emotions. We could just call it like that. We experience negative emotions, painful emotions, feelings that we feel right? Whether they're feelings of, of, of rejection, maybe they're feelings of abandonment, maybe they're feelings of anxiety, maybe they're fe- feelings of, uh, let's see, impatience, maybe they're feelings of worry, maybe they're feelings of where I need to feel in control and I'm not in control, and maybe they're feelings like we're going to talk about this morning of feelings of shame. And the reason why we feel those feelings, the reason why we experience those, is that those feelings are like the gnats in our lives, but even deeper than them being a huge nuisance, those gnats often lead us to sin. And the cause, the root, the banana peel, the trash in our lives is actually the trash of unbelief in our lives. And in fact, we said it like this last week, that the core sin under every other sin is unbelief. And what I mean by unbelief is it's a refusal to rest, to believe, to trust in the promises, the assurance, and the truths of the gospel. That the sins that we sin, they have a a root, they have a place where they begin. And it's not just where I thought this was a good idea. It's not just, well, I thought this would feel good. It's not just, well, I feel justified to respond like this. It's not just our hang-ups. It's just not, uh, well, this is my tendency. Oh, this is just what I do. That the sin beneath the sin, the next level of sin, is unbelief. And what oftentimes is a great indicator of unbelief in our lives are these negative emotions that, we've just, that I just described and I just called. 
And I would say even a next layer under that, because what I'm talking about here is, okay, well, if we believe, then we can fight the negative emotions. That, that, that's, very, that's very practical in our lives, right? That's, that is a very pragmatic place in it that, hey, you want to get rid of the negative stuff in your life, then, well, just believe more. Well, that sounds well and good, but even on another level, like, hear this, that this is, what, this is the life that Christ has called you to. That what we're getting at in this series isn't just helping us feel better. I mean, you can go to Barnes and Noble or you know another bookstore, get on Amazon and buy a hundred books on how to help you to feel better. Like that's not what we're after. We're not just after feeling better, but we're after lives that give glory to God. That's why you've been placed here. That's what your whole life is about. It isn't just feeling better, but your life is about you giving honor, you giving glory to God and you enjoying God. And what oftentimes stops you from enjoying God is this unbelief. That Christ, as we said, I think every week, that Christ hasn't just called us to to believe him, right? Or to believe in him, believe that he exists, but he's called us to believe him in every area and in every facet of our lives. We're to believe him to trust him, to have assurance and confidence in him that he does all things well, that, his, that everything is happening in your life, in your friend's life, all around you for God's sovereign good purposes. That ultimately, we fail to believe when we, when we miss the very character and the very nature of God. That more than, I want you to see this and I want you to catch this, that more than just are we talking about emotions and feelings, that what we're we're pressing here is the very character and the very nature of God and what your unbelief, right, that's indicated by your feelings is saying you actually believe about the character and nature of God. Was that that somewhat clear? I'm I'm on allergy medicine, right? So sometimes it's like my thoughts get up here and they get halfway through and then they get a little scrambled between here and here. But you, 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 you tracking? You following that? So it's more, than just, it's more than just feelings. I feel like we should sing the song Feelings this morning. I don't know. Maybe we will do that as our offertory hymn. All right. So how do we fight? How do we get rid of the trash? Right? How do we battle this unbelief? Will we, will we do it as we as we have faith in God and as we have faith in the promises God has made to us, these very great and precious promises that have been not just promised to us, but they've been purchased by the blood of Christ for us. That he has great stake in this. He hasn't just said them, blah, blah, blah. I promise that everything's gonna be okay. I promise above all that I'm gonna take you to heaven, right? It's not just that, but it's that he's purchased them with his blood. And so this week, I want us to look at the, um, I, want us to, I want us to look at the, the unbelief of m- misplaced shame. And so let's define shame. What are we talking about when we talk about shame? What we're talking about this is shame is a painful emotion caused by a consciousness of guilt or shortcoming or impropriety. So it's a painful emotion. Those of you who have ever felt ashamed or felt shameful for anything, maybe you, can, maybe you can get that, that it's a painful emotion, and it's caused by a consciousness of guilt. So if I cheat on my taxes, right, or if I embezzle money out of the church offering baskets, or if I, I have a church debit card, if I use my church debit card inappropriately, right, to buy a new shirt or to buy Luann some new shoes. I mean, we would agree that that's probably not a church expense, Luann some shoes or, or my kids, whatever they may want. Grayson, a new, a new iPod, he'd love that. But if I use the church debit card for that, like, like that's, that's wrong. You can all agree on that, right? And guess what? Whenever I am conscious of that, of, of, of the guilt associated with doing that wrong, or whenever I'm exposed in that, let's say that I don't even, I don't even understand in my consciousness that, that, that I should feel guilty for that or that's wrong, but I'm exposed in that, right? Destiny Winning, who is the, is the finance uh, manager for the church, when she sees that, you know, hey, there's a $48 charge to, uh, 
Um, DSW, which is a shoe store, Luann shop. Like there's a $48 charge there. What did that come from? And she may ask me about it. I'd be like, well, and give her some story and then, you know, ratchet it up. And then she tells the other elders and the elders come to me. And then, you know, now there's like guilt that I should feel in that. But even beyond guilt, there is a level of shame that I should feel in that. That's properly placed shame. I should feel ashamed. Like, man, I can't believe I've done that. Why would I do that? So it's, it's a painful emotion with the, uh, with a, that comes with the consciousness of guilt or maybe even the consciousness of a shortcoming or an impropriety. And as I thought about this, I remember like whenever I was in high school, at this time, my dad owned a rent-to-own business. We lived in northern Kentucky. My dad owned actually two, same company, but he owned two branches of this rent-to-own business. And so my dad, on occasion, he would take me to school, not because I missed the bus, usually I rode the bus, but not because I missed the bus, but because dad needed to drop me off earlier than when the bus picked me up so he could get on to work. And so my dad would drop me off at the school, and my dad drove a bright orange um, utility van. That's what he ran. I mean, that's what he had. His fleet of delivery trucks, he painted them bright orange. I mean, my dad felt like, hey, that's free advertising. My trucks are my trucks. They should be billboards for my company. So he painted them neon orange with on the side, the name of my dad's business was Yes Rentals. And Yes Rentals on the side, you know, rent to own, get it here, pay now, pay later. We don't care as long as you pay. Like all that on the side, what all he rented, appliances, like all over the van. They weren't, they were used uh, AT&T um, tr- vehicles. They weren't brand new, right? It's kind of like, for those of you who maybe remember the movie Uncle Buck, it was about like that. Pull up, backfire, smoke, all of that. Bright orange van, I would get out, go in the school, and I would feel a level of embarrassment, right? But listen, embarrassment's low-grade shame. I would feel a level of, of shame that that's my dad and that's what my dad just dropped me off in. That shame is different than embarrassment, that embarrassment quickly fades, but shame does not. That embarrassment is usually what we do. We're embarrassed of that. It's for a brief moment. But shame affects our identity. It's who we are. It's how we see ourselves. It's how how we feel that others see us as well. And so maybe as my dad dropped me off, what I could have easily had the tendency to do is not just see it, oh, this is what he has to drive, Right? This is how he makes money, puts food on the, on, on the table for us to enjoy. But now seeing it as, well, no, this means we're poor. right? And now I take on the identity associated with that. Not just, oh, we're low, you know, cla- you know we're, we're below average income. Not even that type of poor, but just, okay, now we take on the identity of now I'm poor and grow up under that. That's what we're getting at when we say shame. Like, in fact, let me tease it out by dividing up guilt versus shame. Because like I said, there's a measure and there's a kind of shame that is right. There's a properly placed shame that when we sin, we should feel a sense of shame. We should feel a sense of heavy guilt. But the Apostle Paul addresses the church in Corinth, and that's the church I told you just a few weeks ago. That church was a, what I call a goat rodeo, right? That church was just a train wreck. And so Paul approaches that. He writes that church a very corrective letter, actually two of them, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, also known as 2 Corinthians, right? And so he writes this letter to him. And as he writes that letter, one of the things that he says on two different occasions, he says, I say this to your shame. In 1 Corinthians 15, 34, he says, wake up out of your drunken stupor. He's not just talking about like a physical drunken stupor. He's saying, like, it's, it's like you're doing life and doing church as a joke here. Wake up out of that, he says. Do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, but you do, so I say this to your shame. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, is what he's saying here. That we should feel guilt and even a level of shame in our sin. And this is a gracious act from the Lord. That if you can sin and feel no guilt, feel no sense of shame in that, that's not a good place to be in your life. That the Bible speaks about there will be those whose consciousness will be seared as with a hot iron. You know, we think about someone who has a, who has a wound, a burn wound, and now their skin on the outside, it's, it's hardened. It's no longer sensitive. 
It no longer can feel. It's totally calloused over. And what the Lord says is people that can sin and feel no shame, feel no guilt in that, it's like their consciousness has been burned. It's now seared over, and that's not a good place to be. (laughs) Amen? Jesus said, I send the Spirit that the Spirit may come and may convict the world of its sin and and of its righteousness. That's what it's come. The work of the Spirit is to convict us, to allow us to feel the pain and a painful emotion when we sin. And if we don't feel that, we should, we should ask for it. We should beg for it. Like if you're comfortable in your sin, and they, you, know, you could think back about the last few days, the last few months, maybe in the last few years, you've got patterns and habits of sinning, and yet you feel no guilt. You feel no sense of shame in that. You're far from the Lord. You should go before the Lord and say, Lord, break my heart. Break my heart. Convict my conscience in this. That that's how it's supposed to work. I remember one time that we were dealing with our, one of our kids who was just at night, they just felt this sense of just fear. Just fear. And, and I'd go in, I'd pray with them, and I'd talk with them. And one day, you know, I asked, I said, what, what do you think's at the root of your fear? What, what's going on? What are you afraid of? It was, it was Grayson, actually. And this is what Grayson said. He said, well, Dad, I know that I, I, know that I lie. And I'm, I'm fearful of, of God in that. And I just was like, thank you, Lord, for being so kind and gracious to my son. And then this is what I said to him. I said, buddy, that's how it's supposed to work that we're supposed to be conscious of our sin so that it may drive us to the cross. And then when we meet Christ at the cross, we should feel as um, Pilgrim's Progress. That's it's a book that probably every Christian should read. That if you haven't read it, it's, it's old and it's a little corny, but it's a book by John Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan. That's the guy with the big blue ox, right? And that, not him, but a man by the name of John Bunyan. He wrote this book, Pilgrim's Progress, and in there, it's, it's really, it's an allegory of the Christian life. And the, you know, the man, the main character in the story is a man that, by the name of Christian. And it talks about Christian goes to the cross. And the whole time in the beginning of the story, Christian's carrying this huge burden on his shoulders. And then when he goes to the cross, Christian says that the burden is lifted from his shoulders. And in fact, the burden falls and it rolls down and rolls into this hole that signifies the empty grave of Christ. This is a way that our guilt should work. It should drive us to the cross of Christ, but it's in the cross and the empty tomb that we find our forgiveness. But how shame works is shame is something that you carry it beyond that. Unhealthy and misplaced shame is when we continue to feel the guilt and continue to feel the shame after the cross, after the empty tomb. That guilt lives in the courtroom where you stand alone before the judge. The guilt says that you are responsible for your wrongdoing and you are legally answerable for what you have done. Guilt says you are wrong. You have sinned. And the guilty person expects punishment and needs forgiveness. And when you understand this healthy kind of guilt, that you hear the sentence and you endure the punishment, and then you go free. But shame, this misplaced, this unhealthy shame that we're really getting after, it lives in the community, not the courtroom. That shame says you don't belong. You are unacceptable, unclean, and disgraced. So because you have done wrong, or let's take it to another level, because wrong has been done to you, Sometimes you feel shame and it's nothing, there's no even sin in it, in, in, there, right? There's not even any sin that's taken place. But you've been sinned against. And because you've been sin against, sinned against, you feel this deep, deep sense of shame that you're an outcast, that you're dirty. Or possibly it's because you are associated with those who are thought of as disgraced or outcast. Because of that, you've done wrong. Wrong's been done to you. 
or because of your association with those who are thought of as disgraced or as outcasts, you feel this, this dirty brand of shame. And it's a deep wound on the soul. That the, ashamed, that the shamed person feels worthless. They expect rejection. The shame is not an internal feeling, but it's also a reflection of expectations. It's more than an emotion. It's a mindset or a perception about, a, about being defective. It's a fear of being exposed. It's a fear of rejection. That shame internalized results in feelings of worthlessness, self-contempt, and inferiority. And I know it's the beauty of getting to pastor a small congregation that I know that many of you, you, you know this firsthand. That you like, you're reading my diary, right? You're reading my thoughts. Some of us, even men in the room, say, man, I ain't got no diary, but you're all up in my business right now. You can believe that. And many of what we, what we do and how we live is based out of this. That feelings like this oftentimes is feelings that have been inflicted upon us at a young age, and we've just grown up underneath of this. It's like, it's like, it's like getting a, a bone that was broken at a young age and no one ever setting it correctly. And so you just grew up and now you walk, you live your life with this limp because of this bone that was broken, whether it was like, well, we grew up in, a, again, association with, well, we just didn't have anything to, nice to wear, right? So I showed up, I showed up to school and everybody else is wearing Air Jordans and my, my shoes came from the flea market, right? I mean, that's me, that's my life right there. You know, so everybody making fun of me with the, my flea market, you know, knock off Air Jordans, right? They had a backward swoosh on them, right? They weren't Nike. They were, you know, something else is what they were. You know, they were Air Pegasus. It seemed like that was the type of shoes that we wore. You know, it wasn't guest jeans. We didn't wear guest jeans, right? Our, our jeans come from Sears and Roba, whatever it may be. Some of you in the room that have experience the trauma of being sexually abused. You understand this sense of shame. You understand this in a deep way. So what does Christ have to say to that? How do we battle the unbelief of our misplaced shame? Well, I think it's greatly illustrated in this story that was given to us, that Danielle read is given to us in Luke, the seventh chapter. It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. So I enjoy very much preaching it. I refer to it often. And so what we have in this story is that Jesus is invited into the home of a Pharisee by the name of Simon. Simon's a self-righteous kind of fella, right? And he invites Jesus and some other um, uh, religious folks that are in the room. And as Jesus is sitting there, says that he's reclining at the table. Now you got to understand like the way that in this culture they reclined at the table isn't how we recline at the table. Like you may look at this story and if you think of it with uh, Western lenses in America, you see Jesus reclined as you reclined, right? At the table, kind of kicked back like this. And this makes very little sense to how does this woman have access to Jesus's feet? But what reclining at the table looked like in their culture was more like this, right? Like this would have been reclining at the table. This is how they would have eaten, sitting down on pillows around a table that would have been about the height of a coffee table, and Jesus would have been kind of, when he said reclined out, spread out like that, his feet to his side. And as he's sitting like that, reclining there, this woman shows up. Immediately they say that she is a sinner. That's probably a euphemism for a prostitute. So this possibly prostitute, sinner, sinful woman, walks in, comes into the home, walks into the room, sees Jesus there, walks over, kneels down, taking a posture of humility, an immense act of love. She begins to wash Jesus' feet using her tears as water, using her hair, right, to dry them. She anoints his feet with expensive ointment. And immediately the temperature in the room changes. Luke says that Simon thinking, like he didn't even say it. Maybe it's written on his face. 
Maybe he's whispering to those beside him. Maybe it's just because Jesus has the ability to know the inward thoughts of man. Jesus picks up on what Simon is thinking, what Simon is saying. And what Simon is saying, the thoughts that he has is, number one is, he's saying to himself, this woman is a sinner. She doesn't belong here. This woman is dirty. She's an outcast. She's not worthy to come here and to come inside my home, much less touch Jesus' feet. I think it's always odd that she knew where Simon's home was, though, right? That may say a little something-something on, on old man Simon, but I'm just reading. I, that's, that's, that, that's not exegesis. That's eisegesis. I'll tell you that right now. I'm, I'm reading that into the text, but I'm just, as we would say, I'm just saying, right? Second thought that Simon has is, look, is that, Jesus, you should be ashamed of yourself. That Simon takes Jesus allowing this woman to do what she's doing to his feet, washing his feet, anointing them with oil, that he takes this as, as, as an indictment on Jesus. And says, Jesus, you shouldn't associate yourself with this woman. I want you to hold on to that thought. And Jesus confronts Simon and he rebukes him using the parable that we looked at. And then he speaks this declaration to this woman. It's found in verse 47. It's the declaration that he makes. He says, therefore, I tell you, and he's speaking this to Simon and all the people in the room, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him, they began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, it's being Jesus, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. And right there at that moment, this woman has two forces coming out of her. She has the first force, which is the force of shame coming at her from Simon and from the community and the crowd in that room who've looked down their religious noses at her and judged her and accused her of being a sinner to which she is. Like Jesus never said, you got it all wrong, she's innocent, right? Jesus declares her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Right? That's why I always say Jesus has the ability for us to quit hiding about our sins, but us to be honest about our sins. But nevertheless, there is this force coming at her, this force of shame coming toward her, compounding shame, indicting shame. And she has a new force coming at her, the force from Christ, the force of forgiveness. His declaration over her, your sins, which are many, are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. And here's the crux of the matter. That whether that woman leaves in peace is wholly dependent upon which force she chooses to believe. That when Jesus says, go in peace, that the key to her finding and living in peace is her believing the declaration that Christ has made over her life, that her sins have been forgiven. And this is really the crux of this whole sermon series, is who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the religious Simons? Are you going to believe your own Simon in your head that speaks those condemning words over you? Or are you going to believe Jesus and his promises and the promises made and the declaration of forgiveness that we find at the cross? See, Simon thought that this sinful woman's association with Christ somehow tainted Christ. He's saying to Jesus, Jesus, you ought to be ashamed of yourself that you'd, that you'd let a woman like this touch you. And Jesus' response, ashamed of myself, I have come for sinners such as her. 
that it's not her association that any way taints me, but it's my association which touches her, my association with her that cleanses her and changes her from being a sinner to being a saint, to being wholly clean, to being forgiven, to having peace. That it's Christ's association is what matters, not how we feel, not that what is said about us, but it is Christ's association with us. That over and over again, the religious community tried to shame Jesus with whom he hung out with. At one place they ask, they say, this man is a drunkard. Like that's what the religious community said about Christ. This man is a drunkard and he hangs out with sinners. Shame on him is basically what he's saying. What Jesus is saying, no, I come and I associate with sinners and I call sinners to myself so that they may find forgiveness for their sins and they may forever be washed, may forever be changed. That's what he's all about. And it's in the cross that we find forgiveness for our sins. It's in the cross that he's taking care of all of the trash in our life. Believe that. And it's in the cross that not only do we find our forgiveness, but it's in the cross that we also find our cleansing that cleanses us from all of our shame, from all of our guilt, from all of the deep stains of our souls that Jesus comes for the outcast. He comes for those that are rejected. I mean, if this is Jesus' declaration, your sins, although there are many, have been forgiven, if Jesus possesses with him an ability to forgive sins which are many, sins of the guilty, can you imagine his heart towards those who are innocent? Those of you in the room who've been sinned against, by a neighbor or a relative? Could you imagine if he can wash away the shame of the guilty? How much more can he wash away the stains and the shame of the innocent? That Jesus has come for the outcast. He's come for those who feel rejected or been rejected, for those who feel that they're not good enough. Jesus came and who did he spend his time with? As we look in the Gospels, Who did Jesus spend his time with? Sinners, tax collectors, religious rejects. I mean, that's who his disciples are. The guys that couldn't make it in the school of religion, they took the cut. Couldn't make, they couldn't get in it. They couldn't make the varsity team, right? They couldn't make the junior, like they couldn't even find their way to the gymnasium. Those are the folks that Jesus came and puts on his team. Gives them starting place on his team. That's me. Thank you, Lord, right? You're the guy that couldn't even kick the kickball. Yay, I choose you. I'm going to take you. You're on my team. But wait a minute. I can't even, I'm not, I don't have any athletic ability. Yeah, I know. It's not about you. It's about me. It's going to make me look real good. Come on. <laughs> right? That's who he's after. That's who he calls to himself. That Jesus comes to those who would receive him. And the religious wouldn't receive him. They wouldn't receive his love because they felt that they didn't need it. And those caught up in shame, we, or you, we, we reject Jesus' love. And we reject him, not on the basis that we don't feel that we need it, but on the basis that we feel unworthy of it. But don't miss this. If the enemy can get you in your religious arrogance to reject the love of Christ, to reject the salvation that Christ gives and to reject Christ, he'll do it. And if the enemy can use your shame to get you to reject the love of Christ, your feelings of I'm unworthy of him, I'm unworthy of it, for you to reject the salvation that Jesus offers, who am I? I'm too dirty, I'm too stained, I'm not a go to that. He'll use that as well. But the crux of the matter is the enemy's attempt, your own flesh's attempt to get you to reject the love of Christ. And what the declaration of the cross is, is I love you and I've come for you. That listen, the character of God, 
Like this is what I said. This, this whole series is about the character of God. Don't miss this right here. The character, the nature, the attributes of God himself, who he is, the very essence of his being is what's at stake here. The character of God is the basis for our connection to him, not our feelings of worth. That he is faithful to you because of his love, not of your worthiness. And he loves us not because we are lovable or unlovable. He loves us because he is love. Now receive his love. Receive it. Come and kneel at his feet. Kiss Christ. Look upon his face. Let him wash away your shame. Let his forgiveness and his declaration of all your sins, although your sins, as it says in the book of Isaiah, although your sins may be as scarlet, he washes them white as snow. Believe that. That the rejection of Christ's love is the root of both our pride and our shame. You gotta understand that that's what's at stake. Unbelief. Unbelief in Christ's love. In Christ's forgiveness. In Christ receiving you. Christ calling. Christ choosing you. We're going to look at that in 1 Peter, our fighter verse for this week. That's, what's, that's what you're, when you, allow, when you allow yourself to be trapped in your shame and you don't battle against it. See, again, it's not about, well, if you feel this, you must not be, you must not be saved. What you need to do is repent. Like, no, that's not what it's about. Like I, we, said this, we said this a few weeks ago. Billy Graham famously said about lust. That, hey, look, they asked Billy Graham one time, you know, on the camera, microphone to, to his lips. Billy Graham, do you ever battle with lust? Billy Graham, un, un, unshakable, right? Love the man. Billy Graham just says this. Well, I will say it like this. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from making a nest in your hair. The same thing is true. The, the feelings of shame that come passing, that are fleeting, or even when you just feel them, they're like a bird flying over your, over your head. And what you must do, you must battle against them. You must fight the fight of faith in those. That's how you stop it from making a, a, making a nest in your head. So what is that battle? What are you fighting? What are you, what are you fighting to believe? You're fighting to believe that Jesus loves you. That's what you're fighting to believe. You're fighting to believe that Jesus receives you. Jesus comes to you. And I would say this to you, find something in this book that's contrary to that. But not only can we see it as Jesus associates with those who feel rejected, those who feel shame, not only do we see it as Jesus in his earthly ministry he associates that with them. But also we see it in the very cross of Christ. That Jesus demonstrates oneness with those who feel shame on the cross. That Jesus endured the shame of crucifixion. That the book of Isaiah says this about Jesus, that he will become a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. That Jesus will be the one who will be despised and rejected by men. And his shame was such that he will become one from whom men will hide their faces. But the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, what does that mean right there? What it means is he, he saw the cross, he understood the cross, and Jesus despised the shame. He understood the shame that would be inflicted upon him through his crucifixion. The crucifixion in and of itself was very shameful. 
And in fact, in the law, the law stated is cursed is any person who hangs upon a tree. The part of it in and of itself that Jesus is taking on a curse. He understood that as well as the physical shame that would be inflicted upon the very king of kings. And yet he humbled himself. He despises it. He allows it. If despising here it doesn't just mean like, well, I despise that. I hate it. What it says is he didn't cave into the shame. He didn't give up because of the shame, but he took on the shame. He allowed himself to be stripped naked, beaten, placed upon a cross, again, outside of the city gates. Jesus is allowing them to treat him as an outcast so he can no longer just say, hey, I associate in some empathetic way with the outcast. But what Jesus can say to those of who feel outcast, I know what it feels like. I was treated as an outcast. Those of you who feel like you're not good enough, I know what it feels like. I was despised and I was rejected by the very people that I come to save. I know your feelings in that. And Jesus will bear the shame. He'll despise the shame. Why? For the joy that's set before him in the cross. And what's the declaration of the cross? What do we find in the cross? We find several things in the cross. Namely, we find that God's glory has been put on display. Second, on our benefit, we find in the cross our forgiveness in the cross and Jesus' declaration that he loves us in the cross. And lastly, we could say this, that we find in the cross an utter defeat of all the enemies of God, including that enemy that is the voice in your head. As Paul says in Ephesians 6, it fires, fires fiery darts of, of thoughts that come flying your way. Your, your way glances and gazes where you read into them. Oh, they're just, they're, they're looking at me and they, they see my shame. They see my nakedness before them. They see what I'm trying to hide so, so much before them. On the cross, he defeats the enemy that speaks those lies to you. That Jesus despises the shame. A book that um, I read as I put together this sermon, it's called, uh, you, you can write it down if this, if you feel like Andy, you're you're touching on something here today, brother. You know, you're, you're on to something. That's what you feel in your heart. Then um, you may want to purchase this book. It's called uh, Rid of My Disgrace by Justin Holcomb. And in fact, it's a, it's a book that I keep on my shelf. I have two copies on my desk of this book. And if you feel like, hey, I could use this, especially if you're in the room and you're a victim of sexual abuse, you say, I could use this. I think this could really help me. And all you need to do is walk into my office, laying on my desk, those two books, pick one up. It's yours, right? Just take it, read it. Pray that God would use it to set you free. But Justin Holcomb writes in his book, he says this, that God is a God of irony. He chose for his son to be born in shame, born into a poor family, to live his life in shame, and then to die in the most shameful manner. That shame is evil's greatest weapon against God. But God takes the weapon of evil and uses it to mock and then destroy evil. The cross initially looks like the ultimate victory of shame. It looks like shame has somehow defeated God. That shame has the upper hand. But the victory of shame and disgrace is short-lived because resurrection interrupts the celebration of evil and triumphs over shame by introducing hope. That Jesus endured the shame of the cross, but he also scorned it. He shamed shame and revealed God's love for, not rejection of you. That at the cross, Jesus triumphed over all your enemies and put them to open shame. That Jesus won the victory and he leads a triumphal process. That shame whispers lies that seduce you to believe that you are alone, rejected, and too stained for God's grace. But Jesus' cross and resurrection proclaim the opposite. Instead of the whispered lies, his response to his people is singing in joy. Do you, do you hear that? 
but the enemy whispering lies about you, lies that you believe. And in Revelation, he's called the accuser of the brethren. But here's the degree of Christ receiving you. That in the book of Zephaniah 3.17, it says this, that the Lord your God is in your midst. He's a mighty one who can save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. The scripture says that when one repentant sinner comes and asks for forgiveness, it says there's great rejoicing in heaven. Do you know who's leading the rejoicing? When you repented of your sins and came to Christ and bowed a knee at Christ, do you know who led the singing and the party? Jesus. Jesus led it. Because that's his love for you. That's how much he, his concern for you. That's how much his care is for you. Oh, sinner, that you would believe it. Oh, sinner, that you would believe it and not believe the lies of yourself or the lies that come from Simon or the lies of the enemy. That you would believe the declaration of the cross of Christ. This week, as we've been doing, each week we've been giving what we call fighter verses And these are verses that help us fight the fight of faith. So again, how are we going to fight it? Well, you've got to fight it by believing. And what are you believing? Well, you've got to believe the promises God has made you, the declaration that he's made about you. And so this week's fighter verse is 1 Peter, the second chapter, starting in verse 9, verses 9 and 10. So maybe you can take inside your skinny, you find one of those fighter verses. Just take this week and read that. I think it would be Super helpful if you memorized it. At least meditate upon it. You know, read it five or six times this week. Try to think about it. But listen what Peter writes. And again, <laughs> next week, Peter's not the dude that's got it all together. Oh, I love the Bible. You know, it's for the religious. Church is for the religious and people got it all put together. No, it's not right? This is a guy that gets it wrong so many times, a guy that rejects Christ, that's ashamed of Christ, and yet then he gets reinstated, and now even after reinstatement, he still gets it wrong, and then he writes this where he gets it so right. It speaks about identity as this. You are a chosen race. Do you see that? Do you believe that about yourself? He chose you. He chose you. Your salvation wasn't accidental. Your salvation wasn't because you finally got smart enough. Somebody won the argument with you. You finally saw and believed. That was Christ's work. Tim, he chose you. I'll take you. Well, I'm not any good. That's right. It's going to make me look real good. You're on the team, right? He chose you. Chosen race. He's declared that you're a royal priesthood. But I'm filthy and I'm a wreck. Yeah, I get it. I know. Believe me, I know. But this is what I'm declaring over you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. That's what he's saying about his church. You're a people for his own possession. He owns you. You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. What what do you, what, what, what? So that, why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into marvelous light. See, wrecks can do this. Wretches that understand our wretchedness, we get this right here. That we're gonna boast and make much of him. It says, once you were not a people, You were outcast, you were rejected, you were scattered. But listen, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Oh, sinner, we sing that song, oh, sinner, believe it.